Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for tuning in to the October 21 term of SCOTUS Cast. I'm your host, Nick Garfinkel, on behalf of the Faculty Division of the Federalist Society. On February 28th, the court heard arguments in West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. With a decision likely to be rendered in the coming weeks and months, we are fortunate to have Garrett Kroll, former Special Advisor of Oversight at the EPA, and Justin Schwab, former Deputy General Counsel of the EPA, for today's post-argument analysis. First, I'm going to provide the procedural and substantive background on this matter, and then the law and policies leading up to oral argument today. And then Justin Schwab will provide his legal analysis and take some time. Uh, Before we begin, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in, and a thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this event. A personal disclaimer, the views expressed herein are my own and not the views of my current employer, nor the views of EPA, a former employer. I'm sure the same goes for Justin. All right, so let's get down to it. Certiorari was granted in this case on October 29th, 2021. Oral argument took place February 28th, 2022. And this was the only oral argument heard by the court. West Virginia versus EPA is perhaps the most anticipated environmental law case in a generation and has implications for administrative law across the board. As a matter of environmental law, it will determine the validity of the Clean Power Plan repeal and ACE rules, and potentially how the EPA will regulate GHGs in the future. As a matter of general administrative law, it may provide an opportunity for the Supreme Court to finally articulate the meets and bounds of the major questions doctrine, under which certain agency regulations are so impactful that they can't rely on ambiguity or gaps in statutory text, but instead need to show a clear congressional intent to authorize a specific type of action taken. This case focuses on Section 111 of the Clean Air Act. The relevant statutory text is available by searching uh, in your your preferred search engine 42 U.S.C. 7411 or Clean Air Act Section 111. All right, so some of the procedure for today's case in West Virginia versus EPA. We're at Supreme Court docket number 20-1530 for those following along at home. This matter was consolidated with three others. A first, North American Coal Corporation versus EPA, second, Westmoreland Mine Holdings versus EPA, and third, North Dakota v. EPA. The case below, that is the case on appeal here, is nine, or is American Lung Association v. EPA, and that's at 985 F3D 914, DC Circuit Dock number 19 1140. So originally, the court had granted 70 minutes for oral argument. However, uh, you know, listening to oral argument this morning, it went for 127 minutes by, by my count. And that is uh, obviously that's nearly double what the court had originally granted. Uh, oral argument was broken into four parts. The state petitioners went first, and that's 19 states total, plus the Mississippi governor up next was the private petitioners, some of which were mentioned in the, in the above case captions. I, uh, I, I briefly referenced, then they had the federal respondents, that was DOJ representing EPA, and, and lastly, last in line there was uh, the uh, power company respondents. So a little bit about the historical backdrop to this case. I, I think, I think it, this, this case uh, it, it's, worth, it's worth going through the last couple of years of history, so we're going to do that now. The Clean Power Plan was issued by EPA in 2015 using the agency's authority under Clean Air Act Section 111D and styled as a rule to control greenhouse gas emissions from existing coal and gas-fired power plants. The CPP would have required states to shift their electric generation mix away from fossil fuels and towards renewables, employing a cap-and-trade credit scheme. Those who challenge the Clean Power Plan's legality argue that the CPP is a totally different kind of rule from the scores of previous rules EPA had issued under Section 111. These critics argue that 
All earlier rules relied upon pollution control measures that could be achieved at and by individual sources actual performance, whereas the clean power plants set limits that existing gas and coal fire power plants couldn't actually meet. Instead, the companies that would run them would have to either build their own renewable power plants, that's wind and solar mostly, or subsidize their competitors to obtain credits to balance out the uh, continued fossil fuel generation from their existing power plants. So the CPP's defenders argue that at least one earlier EPA rule under Section 111D, that's from the George W. Bush admin's Clean Air Mercury Rule, also used cap and trade. That was discussed during OA today, specifically by uh, Justice Kavanaugh. The CPP's defenders also argue that the statutory language is too or is broad enough to authorize this kind of rule design which in, in many people's eyes is why the major, my major questions doctrine is, is relevant and, and at issue here. So as the uh, clean power plant went through the notice and comment period, it received 4 million comments. That was the most on any uh, rule at EPA up until that point and perhaps still holds that distinction. Uh, thereafter, in 2016, the clean power plan was stayed by the Supreme Court after the DC circuit refused to do so. This was unprecedented. SCOTUS had never before stayed a rule while lower court here, the DC circuit was still considering a challenge to that rule. Thus, the clean power plan never actually went into effect. However, as federal respondents in their amici note, the clean power plan's emissions targets were met despite the CPP never actually going into effect. Thus, these parties argue that the CPP's emissions reductions targets were more reasonable than their opponents have suggested in their briefs and elsewhere. That brings us to the Trump administration and the ACE rule. Specifically, in 2019, the Trump administration's EPA published the CPP repeal rule and replaced it with the, or and replaced the clean power plan with the affordable clean energy rule. That's the ACE rule. Because the agency had determined that the CPP's design was unambiguously beyond the limits of the agency's authority under Section 111. The ACE rule was based around heat rate improvements that individual coal-fired power plants could actually achieve. It had no cap-and-trade aspect and was not designed to shift aggregate generation away from coal and fossil generally and towards renewables. In 2021, the D.C. Circuit vacated the CPP repeal and ACE rules, staying the vacature and definitely pending further rulemaking. The uh, mechanics of this stay and its effects were of much discussion, especially uh, from Justice Breyer and his questioning of General Prelogger during oral argument. Uh, nevertheless, in a two-to-one opinion with Judge Walker dissenting the D.C. Circuit and American Lung Association, among other things, rejected EPA's reading of Section 111 in the view that the Clean Power Plan's use of generation shifting implicated the major questions doctrine. It is noteworthy that the principal deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation at EPA and the Biden administration stated no section, and I'm quoting here, quote, no section 111D rule should go into effect until EPA responds to the court's remand in a new rulemaking action, unquote. This is the main basis for the CPP defender's argument that the case is now moot. Again, you can find the uh, decision below at 985 F3D at 914. That's DC Circuit docket number 1911-40. Brings us to today, West Virginia versus EPA. The issue before the court was whether, when designing rules under Section 111, EPA is limited to identifying systems, and, and that word was discussed throughout oral arguments, systems of emission reduction that can be applied to and at the level of an individually regulated facility, or whether there are no limits to EPA's authority other than the textual commands to consider, quote, cost, non-air quality, health, and environmental impact, and energy requirements, unquote, that's from section 111A1 of the act. So what's next? If and when, but probably when, based on the comments made by federal respondents during oral argument, EPA, under the Biden administration, publishes a new section 111 rule to regulate GHGs, the industry and states will almost certainly challenge that rule. Kavanaugh asked federal respondents publicly, what can you guys tell us about the status of the new rulemaking? General Prelogger responded, EPA will issue a notice of proposed rulemaking this calendar year, and a rule is normally completed one year thereafter. Doing that simple math, uh, the timetable uh, looks to produce a new rule in, in 2023 at the earliest.
And because past is prologue, the court could very well state any such rule from EPA before it goes into effect, thus precluding the regulated community from anticipatory compliance while judicial review is pending. A decision from the court on West Virginia v. EPA will be issued later this year, and we were going to have a panel discussion featuring additional guests when that decision is rendered. So there's more to come on this uh, important topic. Justin, the floor is yours. Garrett, thank you very much. Thank you to the Federalist Society uh, for asking me to discuss this today. It's a very important issue. It's a very important matter of environmental law and policy and a very important matter of more general administrative law. Uh, I wanna start as Garrett properly did by making a disclaimer. Uh, I did work at EPA, I was involved in some of these issues, but everything I'm gonna say today is a result of publicly available analysis, the filings of the parties, uh, the questions I asked at oral argument, the general background of the matter. Uh, what I'm saying shouldn't be taken as uh, imputing any view to any other party, to any client I may have, let alone obviously to the federal government back then or today. Uh, Gary gave a good recap of the background and of argument. I just want to note that argument here went on, as Garrett said, for around two hours and six minutes, two hours and seven minutes. So just a hair under the length of the OSHA vaccine mandate argument from uh, January of this year, which was another very long argument on a very a prominent and controversial matter. Uh, this just shows the seriousness with which uh, the court was taking it. There were spirited questions. Uh, it was it was vigorously argued by all parties. Uh, the justices were really digging into the meat of it. And perhaps unlike the vaccine matter, uh, th there weren't, I don't think, many, if any, comments from the bench that will be taken as, oh, can you believe this judge said that? Instead, this was real meat and potatoes analysis digging into it. Uh, uh, this may be because of the subject matter uh, and just the, 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 the context of it. Uh, I am going to divide my analysis of argument and its implications into three general buckets. First, we're going to talk about should the court even decide the merits of this case at all? Is the case moot? Do the parties still have challenge to uh, standing to bring this challenge? Would this be an advisory opinion? That's bucket one. Bucket two is looking at arguments over the text of the statute as it compares to the design of the clean power plant itself as sort of a vanilla matter of regular statutory interpretation without bringing the major questions doctrine into play. And then the third and final bucket is, all right, let's look at the major questions doctrine. Most, not quite all, but most of the justices had some questions to act and sometimes some statements to make about the major questions doctrine. It is hard, it seems, for all parties and all sides and all justices, frankly, in this matter to keep the vanilla statutory interpretation lens separate from the major questions lens. Uh, but there are some important differences, and so we'll talk about the differences and the overlap there. So first, on the question of whether the court can and should decide the merits of this case at all, it's worth unpacking and stressing what Garrett already set up in the background as to why that would even be a question. So let's recap the history here. The Clean Power Plan is issued as a final rule by EPA in 2015. It is stayed by the Supreme Court in February of 2016. And so no state actually had to submit an implementation plan to EPA that would assign standards of performance to the individual existing sources within their jurisdiction. The, uh, the DC circuit litigation was held in abeyance. Eventually in 2019, EPA repealed the Clean Power Plan and in the same Federal Register publication issued the replacement rule, the so-called ACE or Affordable Clean Energy Rule. That all happened in one holistics action in 2019. The day before President Biden was inaugurated on January 19th, 2021, the DC Circuit panel issued its ruling and the two to one majority said EPA was wrong the Trump EPA is too narrowly reading its statutory authority. So we think the Clean Power Plan, at least on the grounds identified in the repeal, th these are not valid reasons to repeal the Clean Power Plan. So we are vacating the repeal of the Clean Power Plan 
And then we're also vacating the replacement rule, the ACE rule, because it was likewise premised on what the TJ Circuit majority found was an erroneous and a too narrow reading of EPA's authority under the statute. But then the DOJ, after the change in administration, asked the D.C. Circuit to withhold, to partially stay or withhold the issuance of the D.C. Circuit's own mandate with respect to the repeal of the Clean Power Plan, while letting the mandate issue with respect to their ruling on the ACE rule. So in terms of the court's view on granting that motion and on the partial issuance and partial stay of its mandate, the ACE rule is vacated. The, the court order is fully in effect there. But the CPP repeal action has not yet actually been vacated because of the partial withholding of the mandate. Uh, at this same time, and in fact, attached to the government's motion for partial uh, withholding of the mandate, was a memorandum issued from EPA to its regional offices, very brief, saying, we understand states are getting nervous about what their obligations to write their implementation plans might be. We need to tell everybody that no rule, clean power plan or ACE, is going to go into effect. States do not have to do anything right now. We, EPA, intend to do a new rulemaking to decide how we're going to regulate in this area under this statute. And the court did grant that. Now, this was a large part of the basis for DOJ and other parties to oppose granting cert here. They said, there's no rule. The states and the industry petitioners are not injured by anything. There is no longer a live controversy, and it would be an impermissible advisory opinion for the court to go ahead and take this case and then reach the merits. Well, that didn't work at the cert stage. Gus Scotus did grant cert. But then all, I believe, of the respondents in their merits brief reiterated these same basic arguments and then indeed led with them, especially the Solicitor General, in argument today. Uh, I think the overall tenor uh, of the court's questioning is that there is not a majority of the court that is going to go with this view. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts repeatedly said, this appears justiciable to me. These parties didn't like the Clean Power Plan. They preferred the ACE rule uh, or maybe no regulation at all, but they definitely didn't like the Clean Power Plan. The D.C. Circuit held otherwise. Why is that not justiciable? Whereas the Solicitor General, to a lesser extent, the industry respondents said, OK, but right now everybody agrees CPP is never going into effect. The ACE rule is not into effect. No state or regulated company has to do anything right now. We, the federal government, we, EPA, will be going through a no, no, new notice and comment rulemaking to come up with a new replacement rule. Wait and challenge that. That was their position in the papers. That was their position in the argument. And it did not seem to get a lot of traction here. I want to note a few justices' particular uh, questions and the responses to that. First, the first justice to raise this question of standing, mootness, advisory opinion, should we even be deciding the merits of this, was Justice Gorsuch. And unless I uh, misheard, this was in fact Justice Gorsuch's only question in the oral argument. He was noticeably quiet, did not ask a lot of questions. This is interesting because he's written at great length, uh, both on the Tenth Circuit and now in the Supreme Court, very prominently on questions of Chevron, questions of the non-delegation doctrine, questions of administrative law and separation of powers, he did not ask any of those questions today. He may well end up writing a writing of some form on them, but he wasn't very active in, in questioning today on those matters. But he did noticeably raise first the question of why are we even going forward this case? Not in an aggressive way, not showing his hand either way, but he did raise it. Justice Breyer, for his point, uh, as, Garrett, as Garrett noted, Justice Breyer, for his part, seemed to have real trouble with the proposition that the D.C. Circuit did not bring the Clean Power Plan back into effect when the D.C. Circuit vacated the repeal of the Clean Power Plan. And the Solicitor General told him accurately that the D.C. Circuit has developed its own sort of, you know, specialized area of case law as to when and how both when a court should vacate a rule that it is finding defective and then when and how uh, its opinions doing so will actually ripen into taking the rule off the books, so to speak. 
Uh, Justice Breyer sort of said, no, nah, I don't take that on faith. Kind of, you know, point me where I should look to, to confirm that this rule CPP is in fact dead. And the Solicitor General at that moment referred him to the memorandum, the internal EPA memorandum to its field offices that was the documentary basis for the motion to stay the mandate. Well, the state, Lindsay C., the Solicitor General of the state of West Virginia, sort of pounced on that, I think it's fair to say, in rebuttal, and said, uh, this West Virginia said, well, Solicitor General is wisely abandoning the reliance in the papers on the, uh, you know, withholding of the mandate. They recognize that short shrift. Instead, they're pointing to this internal man, uh, memorandum, but that can't cut it because we petitioner states had no input into that. We're prosecuting our claim. No one disputes we had standing back then. You can't kind of make our standing go away, make this case of controversy go away, make our injury go away by these kind of pinky swear that we're never going to enforce it. She characterized that as voluntary cessation. And she said that doctrinally, the parties invoking that, A, have the burden, and then B, would have to show that it is absolutely certain that the aggrieved parties will no longer be aggrieved. Uh, Solicitor General C. of West Virginia made a forceful case that that is just simply not the case here. Uh, Justice Sotomayor raised a case which had been cited in the briefing, a 1977 Supreme Court case, I believe, EPA versus Brown. Uh, in that case, basically, uh, EPA had conceded that certain regulations in existence were kind of unworkable and unviable and were sort of dead letters until it revised them. And then the Supreme Court essentially took the view that, well, it would be an advisory opinion for us to pronounce on these merits, uh, that that's kind of the best case. And Justice Sotomayor went the furthest in kind of implicitly embracing that view in her questioning. Uh, but generally speaking, in terms of whether there's a quorum or critical mass of a majority of five justices who think that they should not or cannot decide the merits of the case at this point, uh, I didn't hear it. As I noted, Justice Gorsuch did raise it and then didn't ask any other questions. Not every justice weighed in on this issue. So it's, uh, it's, it's possible that after reflecting on this over the coming weeks and months, it's possible that a majority of justices decide that this should be uh, dismissed, uh, either because they shouldn't have taken it in the first place or because as a prudential matter, they just think it's not appropriate to weigh in now. Uh, but I don't think that's particularly likely to happen. And I think most commentary coming out now shares that view. Uh, the, the rebuttal at the very end of argument from the states, from the Solicitor General C from West Virginia, uh, just said, you have the power, court, to give us an answer, and you should. The court has full power to give an answer here, and it should. This is a critical question. The court has a rule before it, i.e. the CPP and then its repeal, and it, the court, should give an answer. So that was forceful, and uh, I don't like to be in the prediction business on these calls, but this is one where I'll say I will be surprised at this point if the court does not reach the merits of this case. Moving on, then, to the merits of this case, let's first talk a little bit about what I call just plain vanilla statutory interpretation without getting too much into the major questions doctrine yet. And I want to talk a little bit here about what the key features and text of the statute are, and then look at how the different justices and the different councils sort of played around with them. I know that the Federalist Society has made a link to the statutory text available. I would strongly recommend that anybody who's able to, as they're listening along, either live or on a recording, take a look at that text. It's either the, through the link that uh, you've been sent, or else if you just Google 42 USC 7411, you should be able to pull it up. Let's talk a little about where the statute is first. Title I of the Clean Air Act deals, among other things, with EPA's regulation of stationary sources of air pollutants, which is what it sounds like, something that doesn't move, a factory or a power plant is sort of the paradigmatic example. Section 111 is one of the key sort of regulatory programs and regulatory authorities under Title I. And Section 111, or in the code, it's 7411, 7411, is titled Standard of Performance for New Stationary Sources. And then subsection D, as in David, is for existing sources. 
EPA has issued about 70 new source performance standards over the last 50 years since the Clean Air Act was enacted, but it's only issued a handful of existing source rules. One of the main reasons for that is that you can uh, the new source authority is not limited on its face in terms of which pollutants EPA can regulate using it, but the existing source authority is. It's a little argument about what these limitations textually mean in the existing authority, but essentially EPA cannot use 111D to regulate existing sources emissions of hazardous air pollutants, which are subject to the Section 112 Air Toxics Program, and it can't use it for so-called criteria pollutants, which are the focus of the famous NAAQS program, N-A-A-Q-S, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. That's another major program of Title I under the Clean Air Act, which deals with what the appropriate regional concentration of certain pollutants of concern are. I think smog basically in a metro area is the paradigm there. 111D for existing sources cannot be used for either air toxics pollutants or for NAX pollutants. Well, greenhouse gases are a prime example of a pollutant of concern that doesn't fit into either of those two buckets. And so if your new source rule for a source category regulates greenhouse gases, then EPA has the authority and arguably the obligation to do an existing source companion rule. When EPA issued the Clean Power Plan in 2015, it did that simultaneously with issuing new source standards to control greenhouse gas emissions from newly constructed or, or modified gas-fired and coal-fired power plants. And so that was the basis on which it simultaneously also issued the clean power plant itself, which was to govern state plans there. So that's the structural interplay. If you look at the text of the statute itself, the very first words in it are in a definition section. They define what a standard of performance is. And they say a standard of performance, and this is for both existing source rules under D that are mediated through the state program and for the standards of performance for new sources that EPA itself issues under section B as in Boris, the term standard of performance means a standard for emissions of air pollutants, which reflects the degree of emission limitation achievable through the application of the best system of emission reduction that EPA determines has been adequately demonstrated. And so I know that's a lot of words to follow orally uh, with your ears, but if you look at the text, okay, what do you notice? Well, it doesn't say what the best system of emission reduction is being applied to. And so this is the germ or the kernel of the theory of the clean power plan. There are other arguments, but one of the defenders of the clean power plan say, this does not on its face say that that best system of emission reduction has to be applied at the facility specific level directly to the specific sources. And that's true as far as it goes. But now let's look structurally. In section D, as in David, which is the existing source program, EPA prescribes regulations setting up a procedure. And under that procedure, states give EPA a plan and that plan, quote, establishes standards of performance for any existing source for the pollutant in question. And Congress commanded EPA to permit the states, quote, in applying a standard of performance to any particular source under those plans to take into account those sources remaining useful life and other factors. So one of the major arguments the petitioners make is this intertextual structural argument and then looking at the text in D, but not only, and saying, when you read these together, it's very clear. The standards ultimately are being established for particular individual existing sources. And so the design of the standard of performance and EPA's role of identifying what the best system of emission reduction is also has to be limited to things that individual facilities can actually do and achieve. There's that word achievable in the definition of standard of performance, and that's another textual hook petitioner point to to say, aha, 
This means it's source specific. Well, that's kind of the petitioner's view is notwithstanding that there's no thou shalt not go grid wide right up there in front of the definition of standard of performance. They're getting at it through sort of a uh, Gulliver's Travels, tying it down through a bunch of other textual clues and hooks in 111A, the definition of standard performance, and in 111D, the existing source program. Uh, respondents and the government and the uh, industry parties that are essentially like the clean power plan, right, and are defending its legality, they say, no, 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 it's exactly the opposite. Congress said, go find what a system of emission reduction is, and they say that was deliberately broad language. They say it was deliberately meant to be flexible, breathing, evolve, that when Congress enacted these words decades ago, Congress knew that it didn't know every problem that would face the EPA and every environmental problem and every environmental control technique that would arise. And so it deliberately wrote this in very loose and open terms. Uh, that certainly was, uh, that argument did find traction with uh, the Democratic appointed justices but with a couple exceptions that I'll mention, there did not seem to be a lot of appetite from the Republican appointed justices of saying, even as a vanilla textual interpretation matter, oh, yes, yeah, system's broad, so, you know, follow your bliss. That, that is not where folks' head were at. Everybody concedes, and the challengers conceded here, that the word system in system of emission reduction in a vacuum, the word system might be very open-ended and broad. But they stressed and urged that you have to read statutes holistically and in context and giving meaning to all of their words. And so they pointed to the phrase standard of performance itself is only read, can only be read to address measures that actually address the performance of individual sources rather than the source will buy a bunch of credits from renewable generation to justify its continued operation as a fossil fuel generated plant. Uh, that that four point was very forcefully made of that's not a standard of performance. And standard of performance is also defined to include the word emissions limitation. That's not limiting your emissions. You're just either shutting them down or you're still running them but buying credits from someone else. Either way, that doesn't work. It is the petition of the challengers there. And they point also heavily to the existing source subsection, subsection D, to say all of that facility-specific language means you really have to be looking and basing your design, your standards around what uh, individual plants can achieve. Now, one interesting aspect of the case, which did not come up all that much in the question, but DOJ and industry defending the clean power plan did make this gambit is to say, well, no, actually clean power plan is the flexible federalist one because the clean power plan says that states can do a cap and trade system. States can do whatever they want. If a state decides that its sources could do carbon capture, they could do that too. We're letting them do whatever. Whereas under the 2019 approach and under the ACE rule, states would be limited to standards that were really done on a source specific level. Well, isn't that violating federalism? Uh, there just did not seem to be a lot of appetite from potential swing votes here uh, from the so-called center or right block of the court. I don't like using those terms because it oversimplifies things, but just for shorthand, didn't seem to be a lot of appetite there. Now, there was one interesting uh, exception to that, and I want to note that. Justice Thomas, who I think most people would think, oh, this is a safe vote to say CPP is bad, right? But Justice Thomas did ask some pretty pointed questions. I think it was to the industry challengers, to the North American Coal Company uh, from Jones Day, if I'm not mistaken. Justice Thomas said, okay, you're saying that the design of the clean power plan was based on generation shifting, i.e. at the grid wide level, relatively drawing down fossil fire sources of energy and bringing on more renewable fired power plants, more renewable power plants onto the grid. But generation shifting is going to happen as a back end effect whenever you regulate the power industry because this is just how the utility industry operates. So what's the difference? If they can get at the same effect through a more roundabout way, uh, why can't they just design their rules explicitly that way? 
Now, just Thomas could have just been doing what a good judge does, which is probe to really kind of the seams of the argument. I don't want to take this as a sign that he necessarily is going to uphold the clean power plan. I think that would surprise a lot of people. But it is just worth noting that that kind of questioning was not limited only to Justices Kagan and Sotomayor and Breyer, although they were more active in it. Another sort of what I'll call vanilla textual interpretation aspect is the significance of other language within the Clean Air Act. The challengers against the, saying the Clean Power Plan was illegal basically say cap and trade authority, Congress gave it explicitly elsewhere in the statute under other programs. And that means that it should not be read to be within EPA's authority here when they're designing a standard of performance under Section 111. For their part, uh, the, the industry respondents and to a lesser extent DOJ uh, went in a similar direction. And what they said is, okay, fine. Other programs under the Clean Air Act do explicitly talk about retrofit requirements at plants, do much more specifically sort of situate the regulatory verbs, let's say, that are happening at particular individual regulated facilities. So Congress's looser language here in 111A talking about a standard of performance being based on the application uh, of a system of emission reduction, but not saying to what or by whom, that should be given effect. So, you know, forceful, complex, sophisticated arguments of vanilla statutory interpretation on both sides. The overall tenor and take was that there does seem to be a majority of the court that is simply not convinced that the clean power plan was within the statutory authority. But, you know, Justice Thomas is questioning the relative uh, reticence of some other justices uh, across the border on these issues mean that it's not a complete slam dunk prediction, but that does seem to be where it's headed. And that I think is a good segue to the third and final bucket, which is the major questions doctrine. Does it apply here? And what even is it? The general sort of hallway understanding of the major questions doctrine is that normally under the regular Chevron deference world, if a statute is ambiguous or if Congress has left a gap for the agency to fill in, then the court will defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of the statute and its ambiguities or its silences, let's say, although that's more of a policy choice thing, even if the court thinks, well, you could read it another way, and I actually like it my way better, but it is ambiguous, and you can also read it the government's way, so the government wins. That's regular Chevron. Everybody knows how that's supposed to work. What major question says, in essence, is some agency actions have such an impact of such importance or raise questions of such significance in a bunch of different ways that regular arguing from ambiguity for a gap isn't going to cut it. Instead, for these major actions, whatever they are, you have to be able to point to a sufficiently clear expression of congressional intent to authorize this type of action. And so uh, most, not all, but most of the justices had quite a bit to ask and even to say and pronounce about this doctrine. Chief Justice Roberts, another surprising potentially area of argument and maybe a suggestion of where this is all headed and maybe even who's going to write it. Chief Justice Roberts was very interested in major questions and really seemed to want to raise the question of the order of operations, which is, let's say, assuming it applies for a second, when does it apply? Justice Kagan has been forcefully arguing at the vaccine mandate uh, oral argument and today that in her view, major questions only comes in at the end. You go through all the regular Chevron steps, and if you get to an ambiguity in the text, then major questions might come in as sort of a thumb on the scales to say, eh, it's sort of a tiebreaker, eh, this is too big a rule to just argue from silence. Chief Justice Roberts said that's almost like the rule of lenity here. He's not, he seems dissatisfied with that. He directly asked the parties, why can't we do it on the front end? Why can't I, as a justice, look at the action that the agency took, say, whoa, that's a big deal. Think of last year. Whoa, the CDC is doing an eviction moratorium? Kind of get your eyebrow raised already as a court and then go look at the statutes saying, okay, I'm willing to be persuaded, agency and DOJ, but you better have a darn clear statement of authority there because I've already raised my eyebrows in surprise at how momentous 
the action you took was. Uh, and there was at least one amicus brief uh, from the Boyden Gray firm explicitly arguing that it should come at the beginning as sort of a step zero in terms of reversal of the order of operations. And Chief Justice Roberts, he didn't refer to that brief, but he does seem very interested in raising that possibility. Justice Thomas, let's note, his very first question, and he gets to go first because he's the most senior, was, do you need major questions at all to win? And West Virginia said, no, we don't, but we do think it does apply here, and we do think you should make that statement. For their parts, the Solicitor General and the industry respondents kept saying, you can't resolve major questions in this abstract way. And Chief Justice Roberts said, what are you talking about, abstract? I have the agency action right here. I have the clean power plan. I can go look at it and read what it did. That's not abstract. I know what they did. The question is whether A, it was legal or not. And then sub question, does it require a heightened, clear statement of authority to do that kind of rule? Uh, the, the parties defending the clean power plan and then the justices who seem sympathetic to them referred repeatedly to a 2011 Supreme Court case, American Electric Power versus Connecticut, AEP versus Connecticut. In that case, a coalition of blue states and I think NGOs sued essentially the coal-fired power industry saying, you're causing climate change and that's damaging us. The Supreme Court held that even if in the abstract there could be a federal common law action here, the clean power plan, the clean Air Act displaces that federal common law. And specifically, the court unanimously said, I think Justice Alito was recused, so eight to zero unanimously said, Congress has delegated to EPA the authority of whether and how, to make the decisions of whether and how to regulate carbon dioxide emissions from existing power plants under Section 111D. Uh, the rebuttal from the challengers here when pressed on that was, yes, but it didn't say that any potential regulation that they might want to do would be within the scope of authority that they had. So that's kind of where that all went. And Justice Barrett, this might be a good note to sort of close on here, or, or two, two more notes to close on here in terms of two other justices uh, with different takes on this, potentially. Justice Barrett asked, what's the daylight between the major questions doctrine, which is about how you read a statute, and then the non-delegation doctrine, which holds that there are constitutional limits on Congress's ability to delegate its legislative power over to executive agencies, even if it wants to. And the state said, we don't think you need to get into that latter one here. Congress did not give the clear statement here, states say. And so you don't need to get into whether they constitutionally could have, because we just think they didn't. But Justice Barrett later on in her questioning again seemed to say, you know, this is environmental, this is EPA's job, you know, this doesn't seem like maybe a category mismatch. You're just saying this rule was a really big deal and we don't like it. Kind of help me out there. How do I deal with that? And in that light, it's very noticeable Justice Alito. Justice Alito did not speak much when the, when the challengers were up, but he became very active when the respondents spoke. And Justice Alito asked industry respondents the following question. He said, if an agency decides it has some big new power that it hasn't used before, but the agency's actual first step in regulating using this power is relatively humble, it takes only 5% of the potential space that it, its theory of authority says it could, is that not a major question? And if it does that, and then the next time it takes another 5% and another 10% of the possible space, can the agency sort of, and the government, the executive branch sort of evade major question scrutiny by proceeding by stages. Now, that's important because a lot of argument here on the defenders of the CPP have said, actually, it wasn't that revolutionary, because even though it was stayed and never went into effect, the reductions that CPP projected wouldn't happen until the 2030 and would need the CPP to do have basically voluntarily happened through market shifts anyway, trying to say it can't be major if it happened anyway, even though the CPP was stayed. And so Justice Alito's question really seems to zoom in on what I've long thought might be the ultimate crux of the major questions aspect of this case, which is, can the major questions doctrine be activated not by the sticker price of a particular rule or even in an area which has already been subject to some kind of regulation based on what might be an unlimited theory of authority of what the agency could 
do even if the step it took is portrayed as by itself not rising to some existential colossal titanic impact and that if they do decide they have jurisdiction to hear the case and if they do d decide not to resolve it solely based on vanilla statutory interpretation and if they want to really flesh out how major questions work that could really come into play and you could start seeing if your theory of authority is that systems very unbounded and then other than the requirement to consider cost energy requirements and non-air quality health and environmental impact those are your only limits which is essentially what the dc circuit held can that right there take you from regular regulation to invoking the major questions and triggering the major questions doc Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 